Welcome to a code report solution video. In this video, we're going to be covering the solution to the problem entitled Distinct Pairs from the Code Chef January 2019 Long Challenge. The problem states Chef has two integer sequences, a1 to an and b1 to bm. You should choose n plus m minus 1 pairs, each in the form ax by, such that the sums ax plus by are all pairwise distinct, aka different. It is guaranteed that under the given constraints, a solution always exists. If there are multiple solutions, you may find any one. So a very nice short problem statement and an interesting problem. Uh, the uh, constraints for this problem are that n and m, the length of our lists a and b, will be between two times, 1 and 2 times 10 to the 5th. Uh, the values of the elements in a and b will be between uh, negative 10 to the 9 and 10, 10 to the 9. So integers should be fine. And uh, all the values in A and B respectively uh, are going to be pairwise distinct within the arrays themselves. So let's take a look at the example that CodeChef provided us with. So this is the example. Uh, the first two numbers, uh, N and M, are the lengths of our two arrays, A and B. So A has length 3 and B has length 2. And then the next two lines just correspond to the values of the elements in our arrays, A and B. So A consists of the elements 10, 1, and 100 and B consists of the elements 4 and 3. And uh, for the output for this problem, there, there are many different answers, but it's basically giving you the indices. Uh, the first one corresponds to array A, and the second one corresponds to array B of uh, the elements when combined produce a value. So if we calculate these values, we get the following. So the first one, 100 plus 4 is 104. The first elements of both, 10 and 4, give us 14. Uh, the second and the first from A and B give us 5. And the first and the second, 10 and 3, give us 13. So uh, this is n plus m minus 1. So 3 plus 2 minus 1 equals 4 values that are created by choosing one element from A and one element for B. So the problem is just asking us to generate uh, n plus m minus 1 pairwise distinct values. So all of these values that are generated, given the indices that you output, have to have different values. So this seems like a pretty straightforward problem um, that should be solvable in, in basically linear n plus m minus 1 time. Um, but the problem that we run into is when we have uh, overlapping values that we're calculating when we're doing sort of our nested for loop. So uh, this problem does not show that at all. So let's take a look, or this example doesn't show that at all. So let's take a look at a different example that I came up with to sort of illustrate this problem and how we're going to deal with it. So here is another example. Uh, we have n and m equal to 10 and 8. Uh, and the values of our arrays a and b respectively are as follows. So you can see that all of the values in b uh, are the first eight values of the elements in A. And if we just create a nested for loop uh, that's going to first loop over A and then in the inner loop loop over B to generate values by just combining the two, we end up with the following. So at first we're going to start with uh, from our array A the first value and then we're going to loop over all of the eight values in array B to generate the following eight values, so two through nine. Uh, so this is fine and dandy, and we're about halfway to creating all of the values that we need for our final solution. And at this point, we move to our next element, uh, the value 2 in our array A. Uh, but at this point, when we loop over the next eight elements, the only new ones that we are able to add is 10, because 2 plus 1 all the way to 7 uh, is going to be the 3 through 9 that we've already calculated. So we're going to have a hash set that basically keeps track of all of the values that we've calculated so far so that we can do that in a constant time lookup. And uh, anytime we've seen that we've already calculated a value, we're not able to output those indices that correspond to it. So by looping this way, it's pretty suboptimal in that for the next few loops, we're only for each sort of linear runtime over our second uh, array B, we're only going to be adding one element. So the trick that I sort of just came up with, I'm not sure if this is the official solution, um, but was just to basically alternate from uh, looping in your outer loop from choosing a value at the beginning of the list and choosing a value at the end of the list after, of course, uh, sorting all the values. So in this example, they're already sorted, but um, if you are just given random input, sort them first, and then on your first loop, choose the first value, and on your second iteration, or so first iteration, choose the first value, and on your second iteration, have a second index that points to the end. And if we do that, so instead of doing uh, 2, if we use 10 instead, we end up with the following. 
Uh, so 10 plus 1 all the way to 10 plus 8. And at this point, we're only one value shy of the n plus 1, n plus m minus 1 values that we need. Um, so I wasn't sure if this was going to work, but I figured it was a good way to sort of try to avoid overlapping. And of course, if you uh, switch back to 2 after having done an iteration at the end, you'll get the value 10, and that'll give us 8 plus 8 plus 1 values is 17, which is n plus m minus 1, the 17 values that we need. So uh, with only doing sort of three iterations, uh, doing this sort of alternating back and forth, we're able to solve this. So just to recap what the solution is, uh, the first step is we're going to do a nested for loop to create the pairs. Uh, we're going to have a hash set to avoid duplicating values. And uh, the most important part to uh, get the full pass is to alternate the outer loop with two indices, one for the front and one for the back. So just alternate using these. And note that if you if you don't implement uh, the third step, I think you can still get the quarter of the points for this problem. Um, but in order to get a full passing solution, you have to do something like this. So there might be other solutions on how to solve this, but this is how I went about solving it. So uh, that being said, let's take a look at our code. So here's the C++ solution. Uh, at the top here, we're just reading in our values n and m, and this is just a temporary variable that we're going to use to store values into our map. Um, I chose uh, uh, the map from the C++ data structures to store this. Uh, I apologize if, Dennis, if you're watching this, I know it's more efficient to use a uh, vector of pairs, but um, for the simplicity of reading things in, and um, just map is shorter to write than vector pair int int, um, I decided to go with map. And by default, the map is going to be sorted, so we don't need to worry about sorting our vectors after that. But you could have used a vector of pairs, and that would have worked as well. So uh, what we're doing here is we're reading an x, and then we're setting the key to be the value, and then uh, th the value that we've just read in, and then the value and the key value pair is going to be the index that we are currently at. Because at the end of the day, we don't want to output the value that we've uh, calculated, we want to put the index of the element in the corresponding A uh, arrays A and B. So we have our, our two maps created once we've finished the first four lines, then we declare a hash set scene, which is going to keep track of the values that we've already calculated. We have a boolean, which we're going to call front, and this is going to keep track of whether we are choosing a value from the front of the array or from the end of the array. Uh, and then we're setting up two iterators, one pointing to the beginning and then one pointing to the end. Note that we have to do a pre-decrement on the pass the last element that's returned, iterator that's returned from the end method. Then we have a while loop here that's just saying we're looping while the size of the uh, values that we've calculated are less than m plus m minus 1. And uh, the first line of this while loop is us toggling the boolean because we need to do that each time we iterate in our loop. Uh, then we are choosing our iterator based on this boolean. So if front is set to true, then choose the iterator at the beginning of our array. Otherwise, choose it at the end. And then we have our inner loop. So we're using a range-based for loop to loop through the values in our array B. And we're, we're inserting our value that we've now calculated by taking the keys from both of our key value pairs that our uh, iterators point to. And uh, we're storing this in uh, the return from our insert in this iterator here. Or a better name for this would have been p, I guess, because it's not actually an iterator. It's a pair of uh, an iterator and a Boolean. And then we're using the Boolean in that pair. So for those of you not familiar, uh, the return value from an insert method on a hash set in C++ is a pair where the first of uh, the pair is an iterator pointing to where that element was inserted. And the second of our pair is a Boolean saying whether it was actually inserted or not. So if it's set to true, that means the element didn't exist or the value didn't exist and we were able to insert it. Uh, but if it already existed, it's going to be false. So we only want to output the indexes or indices when we successfully inserted a new value. If it's set to false, that means it already existed and we don't want to output these indices. And uh, then we just have an extra check uh, alongside our condition in our while loop that says if we have at this point um, increased the size of our uh, scene hash set to be equal to n plus m minus 1, we want to break out of this for loop. And then outside of our inner for loop, we want to increment or decrement um, the iterators i and j depending on whether we uh, just processed uh, an iteration at the front or the end of our array A. 
And so once you've finished this nested loop with the while loop on the outside and the range base for loop on the inside, we can just uh, return because we are done. So taking a look at one other solution is the Python solution. So this one's a little bit different. We didn't use uh, a hash, or I guess it wasn't a hash map. It was an ordered map, um, a tree map in the C++ solution. Uh, here we're going to use a list of lists and then sort them manually because we can make use of Python's enumerate function, uh, which basically is going to... Uh, pair the index with each of the values that we get from our input. So on the first line, we're reading in n and m. And then on our next two lines, we're using list comprehension and the enumerate method to basically read in our values and then pair them with the indices. Uh, on the next two lines, we're sorting both a and b because that's going to enable us to solve uh, the full solution. Then we're declaring our hash set scene. Then we're declaring the Boolean front. Then we're declaring our two indices. In the previous solution, we used iterators in C++, but Python, uh, it's much easier to use indices. And then we have basically the exact same uh, nested loop. So uh, while the length of our hash set scene is less than n plus n minus 1, we toggle our front variable. We set uh, a local x. Uh, from A based on front, and then we have our inner for loop for the values in B. We calculate the current value that we're trying to uh, figure out if we can output the indices for. If this value doesn't exist in our hash set, we output the indices, and then we add this value to our hash set, and then we check is the length of our hash set equal to n plus n minus 1. If so, break, and then we do our incrementing or decrementing of our indices as needed. So the last thing to talk about is the time complexity for this problem. And the time complexity is going to be uh, O of n log n. So technically, it's O of max n comma n log max of n comma n. So whichever n or m is bigger um, is going to be driving the time complexity of this. And then the sort is what is the really the worst case complexity at the end of the day. So there is a plus linear sort of n plus m with some sort of coefficient on it. Um, but that is going to fall away because the n log n is going to be uh, bigger than that uh, component of the time complexity. As always, if you enjoyed this video and found it helpful, hit that like button. If you want to see more, make sure to hit that subscribe button. You can follow me on Twitter for reminders 30 minutes before contests start, and you can find all of the code shown in my videos on my GitHub page. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.